Hello! Welcome to another episode of Ancient Office Hours by the Ozymandias Project. Trireme Transit is now boarding for all new and returning passengers. Now departing, present ponderings. Next stop is Ancient Office Hours at a library lost in the sands of time. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 83 of Ancient Office Hours. This week, I sat down with Dr. Alan Lenzi, a professor of history at the University of the Pacific. He is the author of Secrecy in the Gods, Secret Knowledge in Ancient Mesopotamia and Biblical Israel, An Introduction to Akkadian Literature, Context and Content, and is the editor of Reading Akkadian Prayers and Hymns, An Introduction, and is co-editor with Jonathan Stickel of Divination, Politics, and Ancient Near Eastern Empires. His current research focuses on Akkadian prayers, especially those labeled with the Shwila rubric. In this episode, we discuss getting into the ancient world via biblical studies and music, whether Gilgamesh translations have been done to death in Assyriology, and how the portrayal of ancient Mesopotamia in popular media has changed. I hope you enjoy this episode, and if you like what you hear, please give us a five-star rating and review us on Apple or Spotify. You can also subscribe to our Patreon, as this will allow us to reach more people and make more exciting ancient world content. Enjoy! Thank you so, so much for joining me on the podcast this morning. I want to start us off with what I hope will be a very easy question for you, which is how old were you or when did you discover that you had a passion for learning about the ancient world? Well, I think in college, I realized that I was very interested in the ancient world in a limited way. I got into ancient studies via biblical studies. I actually went to college to be a music major, a performance major, and that wasn't working out very well for various reasons, one of which was I just did not have the disposition to perform in front of people. And that's a problem. Is, is You can play really great in a practice room, but if you can't perform, you can't be a performer. And so I, I kind of went through a crisis. I was attending a religious denominational school, college, And I had already taken some biblical studies classes. And so I thought, you know, I'm really interested in this. And I always knew that I wanted to learn more about the the biblical traditions. So I took some extra classes. I enrolled in um, Koine Greek, took a year of Greek. And I just, I realized then that, you know, I'm not going to be a performer and this is really interesting. So I want to do biblical studies. And I ended up getting my my bachelor's in biblical studies, took a, a couple years of, of Greek and a year of Hebrew and realized I wanted to, to go on and study academically the, the biblical material. And that kind of was an entry or a gateway into the broader ancient world for me. So if I was going to put a number on it, I would say I was around 19 or 20 years old. But the, the odd thing is looking back, I know that my curiosity was there. You know, I was the kid in Sunday school class at church who asked the weird questions and none of my Sunday school teachers would know because, of course, they were just lay teachers who didn't really have any training. (laughs) So officially 19 or 20, but I I can see that the seeds of that curiosity were already in me as 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 a young person. Like I remember sixth grade especially. Asking, asking all kinds of questions, and people just couldn't satisfy my curiosity. There you go. Yeah, I feel like sixth grade is that magical year, because that was the year that I also became very interested in studying the ancient world. But for me, my gateway was ancient Egypt. So the rest is history. It's interesting how then you got your start with the sort of biblical side. And now I'm I'm a bit curious... Since the biblical stuff came first, when you started doing Babylonian, like did, did that kind of emerge as I want to look at this from the lens of what I already know here? Or did that develop as a separate interest where, hey, the Babylonians are kind of cool. Let me just learn about this on their own. Because of my background coming at ancient studies via biblical material and really m- interested in the normative element of scripture in the Christian tradition. That is, I was looking at this material as scripture, right? Not as just another source. 
And so I, I headed to seminary in Philadelphia to do a, a master's and not a master's of divinity, which would be something a pastor would get, but just a master's, an MA in the biblical material. And I was introduced to people who had studied at fairly prominent graduate programs where they did their PhD. And so the, the a lot of the classes, like I took a gospels class again, um, I took a class on <clears throat> the Pentateuch or the Torah, the first five books of the Bible again, but I did so with people who had studied in a Near Eastern language and civilizations department, say at Harvard or at Yale. And I studied with people who had been introduced to Akkadian, which is the language of the Babylonians, at least what we call the language, one of the languages of ancient Mesopotamia. And so, you know, I, I began thinking, this is really interesting. And I, my interest in the Greco-Roman background in the New Testament sort of faded as the professors that were teaching in the Old Testament Hebrew Bible department, they just really captured my interest. And I thought the, 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 the ancient Near Eastern background of the Hebrew Bible is so compelling. Uh, if I really want to understand the Old Testament, you know, which as a as a Christian scripture, we call it the Old Testament. If I really want to understand that, then I need to go study somewhere where I can also study Babylonian or ancient Mesopotamia. And so I did, you know, I, I applied to various places. I, I went to Brandeis University and within the very first year, I realized I am just not interested in the Bible. Like I used to be the ancient Babylonian stuff is just so much more compelling and it was relatively unworked. So if you go into a seminar in, in, in biblical studies, you know, all these graduate students sitting around talking about one or two verses of the Bible for like three hours, okay? Mm -hmm. And at the end, somebody comes up with something novel and the professor says, oh, that's interesting. I'll write that down. And, you know, it was like a great success. Like, oh, wow, I said something he'd never heard before. But then, you know, when you say, oh, is that something I should pursue? Like, has no one, no one's ever done that before? It's like, well, the, the problem in biblical studies is that if it's never been, if you think that it's never been done, either A, you're wrong and it has been done, or B, it's just wrong. And I thought, that does not sound like a, a place to be creative. <laughs> uh, it's like trying to write an, a, a dissertation on Shakespeare now, you know, everything's been done to death. <clears throat> there are literally 600 page monographs on one verse. And I just, I saw that my first year and I thought, I want to do Babylonian. And I really, I mean, I talked to my wife because I, I was married, you know, and when I was pretty young. And so during graduate studies at Brandeis, we were, we were uh, already married and we already had a child, I think my first year. And so um, I said, I want to transfer. I want to see if I can do a PhD in Assyriology. And she's like, what? <laughs> and I went to my professor. So we had three different professors, one Hebrew Bible specialist, one Hebrew Bible Northwest Semitic specialist uh, who taught like Aramaic and Ugaritic and things like that. And then one Babylonian or Assyriology professor. So I went to the Assyriologist named, his name is Tzvi Abush. And uh, he's since retired from Brandeis, but he he was sort of my Assyriological mentor at Brandeis. He, he wasn't sort of, he was. And I said, I want to do Assyriology. And he said, why? I told him why. And he said, well, it'll be very difficult to get a job. And I said, well, I know, but I, I really want to do it. And we talked back and forth a little bit in the practicalities of transferring and all of that. I mean, I was in a fully funded program and, and I, it's not like I hated the Bible. I mean, that I really enjoyed it. In fact, I, I my dissertation was a comparative dissertation on biblical material and a seriological or Babylonian material. He said, you should just, you should stick out, stick out the program, stay, stay with us. And I did. And I'm really, really grateful that I, that his advice was sound. And, you know, eventually I got hired into a religious studies department that was also a, class, a classical studies department, religious and classical studies. It was a very strange hybrid here at University of the Pacific since it has um, changed into religious studies. And then a couple of years ago, religious studies closed. So I'm in the history department now. But um, at the time, you know, 17 years ago, it was a really good professional move to do the comparative 
um, biblical and historiology. So I think I might have veered away from your original question. Was it, you know, the Bible or this? It was both. And in, in professionally speaking, doing both served me very well. And, and you know, once I realized I was going to get tenure and here at Pacific, it, it wasn't a narrow idea of what you could do to get tenure. Once I'd published enough to get tenure, um, I could essentially do whatever I wanted in my research, which is both good and bad. But so anyway, I think I've I've answered sort of in a shotgun method the various uh, the couple elements of your question. Feel free to follow up, of course. Yeah, well, I'm I I want to go a little bit back for people who are interested in both fields and are kind of looking around, well, how do I make a decision or should I make a decision? The language element comes into both of them. Now, as someone who's done both, what languages would you say are more important to try to pick up or learn or what will be most helpful if you want to do something in biblical studies versus Babylonian stuff? I would say for both biblical and Assyriological streams or trajectories, the language that one should be studying an undergraduate is German. <laughs> I did a little bit of German before graduate school, and you know, it's so important to read and to read well. I know that that's probably not what you're looking for. You're looking for the ancient language, but and in fact, if we just limit ourselves to ancient languages. And I'm not really joking about German. If you're an undergraduate headed to a biblical studies program, MA or PhD, do a couple years of German and be able to read German relatively decently. Um, and, and this is the kind of thing that will ebb and flow. You, you'll get you'll get really good after reading a few books all summer, and then you'll let it slip for you know the school year. And then the following summer, you'll start over and you'll be a little slower. You know, it's one of these kinds of things that just it fades in and out. It's sharper sometimes. It's, you know, it's like any tool. But in terms of ancient languages, if I were going to go into the biblical studies, like a MA, I would take a year or two of Hebrew if I could. Not every university is going to teach it. I've only taught it here at Pacific one time for one year. And it had such a low enrollment that I wasn't allowed to, to teach it ever again. If you're going to, in this, to uh, do a seriology, honestly, I, you're not going to find very, I mean, unless you're at an Ivy League school or one of the places with a huge NELP department, you're not going to be able to take Babylonian as an undergrad unless you're at Harvard or Yale, maybe Columbia. Among the publics, probably be able to take it at Berkeley, maybe, or UCLA. But there's relatively few places. Hopkins comes to mind as well, but relatively few places. So take Hebrew. And, and one of the good things about this is that even if you become a pure Assyriologist, you know, completely unhindered by all of that biblical material um, and just, you know, praise Marduk kind of a Assyriologist, the Hebrew will serve you well because it's cognate, you know, and so there's going to be things that you recognize. Moreover, if you find yourself in a pinch for a job later and you've kept your Hebrew up a little bit, you can say at the job interview, oh, uh, Hebrew, yeah, if you'd like to teach Hebrew, I, I, of course, sure, I can teach Hebrew. Th that is actually a really good idea. And, and you know, you'd be surprised how many people are actually interested in that. And so to have that as an Assyriologist, and a lot of Assyriologists have done Hebrew, um, even if they've let it slip, you know, it's not that hard to get back to. The script is, you know, the script is weird in, in, initially. Uh, for most of us Westerners. Yeah, so I would say among the ancient languages, do biblical Hebrew if you can for both. And in terms of modern, do German for sure. It's good to get that perspective just because I spend so much of my time talking to fellow classicists where, yes, we need German, but they say you also have to have a huge emphasis on French. And I just was not sure whether you need really... French to go into a different geographical ancient area. I, I mean, probably. I mean, there's good scholarship in, in any language, I'm sure. So yeah. French might be helpful. But yeah, it's interesting because I think my, my preconceived notions would have been if I want to study like the ancient Hebrew Bible, I'd need to pick up like Aramaic well, or yeah, something. Well, yeah, you will. Or... You will. I mean, 
you start with Hebrew, but if you're going to do Hebrew Bible, you should do biblical Aramaic. You probably should do some Ugaritic. You should probably do some Syriac. And if you're an Assyriologist, German is probably the language, the modern language with the most non-English language with the most scholarship. But like if you're really, really interested in a particular setting, so like if you're interested in Mari, which is an area in on the Euphrates that, that Hammurabi came into conflict with in the mid-18th century BCE, if you're going to do Mari, you have to do French. If you're going to do Ebla, another particular site, you need to do Italian. You just, you have to do it because a lot of the scholarship, because the archaeology and archaeological team, you know, because of the background on the scholarship, you need to do Italian. There are material that's published in Dutch. There's material being published in Spanish. And so anybody who's doing ancient studies is going to study multiple languages. You may never become fluent in these, but to be able to read, you know, th there was a couple articles from the recent book I finished that that were in Italian, and I just, I, I had to read them. And so, you know, you I have a little bit of background in Latin, just a little bit, and I knew some Spanish, I've done French. So you get the dictionary out, and you, you know, you, you just make your way through. And it gets easier as you go, which is really cool. You know, by page five or six, you're like, oh, this is not so hard. And, and then you don't do it for six months, and then you just sort of like, oh, yeah, this is, this is hard. And then you panic again because you realize that you can't remember and then it's like starting over and then it's fun. But then you do have that um, stored memory. So it comes back a lot faster, but it's still fun when you hit the wall and you're like, wait. Yeah, I, I wouldn't use the word panic, but I understand why you would. Uh, because sometimes we do these things with deadlines looming or, you know, uh, when I was finishing my dissertation, I was we were so poor. Oh, my gosh, we were so poor. I was staring down the barrel of another continuation fee, you know, and I did not have it. I just didn't have the money to continue. <laughs> I just think, I just remember thinking, I have got to finish this thing. I've got to get it done. And, you know, it's the last week or two before I could submit. And yeah, but panic, is, I think as you get a little bit older and you realize, you know what, I'm never, ever going to learn everything I want to learn. And I'm not going to be able to remember everything I've learned in the past. And there are some things that are going to be my expertise, my forte that I'm just really good at. And there are other things that my disposition is such that hard, you know, it, it, think about the scientist who loves biology, but hates math. I, I literally heard EO Wilson say, you should be a biologist, even if you hate math, if you hate math, hire a mathematician for your project. He's like, I, you can't be good at everything. And I really feel like that's super, super important for people to understand. I remember Bernadette Bruton was the early Christianity professor at Brandeis when I was there. She was mostly gone because she had just gotten a MacArthur Fellowship. So she was mostly gone. Um, but every now and then I just remember running into her. And at one point I said, you know, the problem I'm having is I'm interested in everything. And she's like, that's wonderful, which is, you're like, okay, but that's not wonderful because, and she's like, no, you, you sh it's great that you're curious about everything and you should study everything. You'll find your focus. You know, and I'm like, that's good advice. It's true. It's true because I, I, I feel like I hear too many young folks. I remember when I was going through undergrad and I just told my professor, I don't want to specialize in one thing. This is why I don't want to be forced to go to grad school because I love everything and you can't be a specialist in every single thing. And um, yeah, his advice was, well, you can be more of a generalist. That's fine. I mean, he, he definitely was like, I'm going to be real. That means you really can't go to grad school if you really want to do general things. And I said, that's fine. I will do something else. Yeah, I think it, we see it as a problem to be interested in everything, but it's not. Right. Because we have so many people who are specialists in certain things that they don't have time to look at the big general things. And the thing that I think we forget a lot is like the general public and people who are not in the field. They want like the simple questions answered. Uh, I was talking with someone just the other day and they we were at, talking about like ancient warfare or something. And instead of going into this long, beautiful thing about some tiny detail, they were like, 
how did logistics work? How did that many troops find a place to go to the bathroom? And I was like, wow, that's a really general question that if I had an expert on like ancient warfare, they may or may not. And actually probably would not be able to really answer that. But I don't know. It's uh, fascinating. I have a little anecdote that is a little bit humiliating, <laughs> but also along those lines is actually very important to to help those headed to grad school understand that the general public often is not interested in drilling down into that one little specific. So when I was in grad school and I was dissertating, I was very focused on a particular issue and the nitty gritty of all of that, filling in footnotes and such. And my wife was beginning her writing career and she was writing short stories at the time. She's now writing novels. But at the time, she was just starting out writing short stories. And she was writing about Hammurabi's Babylon and the kind of political and diplomatic issues that are in the historical record between Babylon and Mari and why eventually Hammurabi destroys Mari in a, in a battle. And she was writing about these people, people in the story and very much interested in everyday life, quotidian things. And, you know, so she would come and say, hey, I'm, this guy's going to be eating a meal. What did the Mesopotamians eat? And I said, well, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like, okay, in Acadia, I learned the weird for, word for beer and bread. <laughs> and I, I was embarrassed to say, I have not thought about this because we have been reading myths. We've been reading prayers. We've been reading, you know, this kind of, high culture stuff that the scribes were copying and I've not been now there are seriologists who specialize in this of course but I was not among them and my program didn't emphasize that we were emphasizing literature and so I was embarrassed frankly you know that I was the live-in a seriologist my wife came to me with questions and more than once I had to say I don't know and um, it made me realize that you know what I'm studying is just a sliver, really, of what a lot of people would be interested in studying in the sphere, the cultural sphere and chronology. Um, and, and I'm not actually doing it. And so it, it was humbling. It was really, and it was embarrassing. To your point, it, this is the kind of thing that, that scholars in their, in their graduate study program, they get this tunnel vision. And I think it's good. I think that every scholar should have their specialty where, you know, I'm great at this, but the wide ranging curiosity that you're describing needs to stick with us too, especially since very few Assyriologists are going to teach in a program where they can specialize on uh, that philological issue. Most of us are going to teach in departments where they're saying, can you teach Islam? And, you know, to get a job, you say, yes, yes, I can teach Islam. Can you teach comparative religion? Give me a year or so. You bet. I'll have that syllabus ready. Let me have a little bit of time over the summer to get it ready. Um, and so you having that wide ranging curiosity in terms of employability, marketability and all that, which, you know, I know academics hate to talk about. But in a tight job market like we have, if you're going to be an academician, you got to be broad. You got to be curious. You got to be willing to learn outside your specialty. And to get tenure, you're going to need to have that narrow focus. Now you're talking about non-academics, of course, and and that's that's a little bit different animal. Yeah, but I think it is definitely very valuable to be aware of. And I mean, to your anecdote, which I think is fascinating and great, but not uncommon, I I do spend a significant amount of my time thinking the higher one goes in academia and in specialization, the more you are going to be the person saying, not my area. I don't know. Not my area. So it is kind of a, an interesting little thing to note that, yeah, when we just think about kind of progressing, right, we always think, oh, yes, progress means getting higher and higher. But sort of in this field, it's really interesting how most people, they want to respect you because you've gotten and progressed higher. But also the value of information that they want to know from you is 
smaller and smaller. So it's it's really kind of backwards how the generalists who kind of get the broad overview of all the things and can answer all the broad questions are the ones that end up being they're not more popular that's a really bad way of saying it but like the ones that people would be more likely to go ask because there's a higher chance that you would have the desired information and then only after you get that from sort of a generalist you could go and say okay can you point me to the person who does this and this and this and then you're like yeah sure you're golden here you go well and and i think both the academy and the general public need both we really we need people to drill down you know we need those people that are just like i am going to know one little thing super well better than anybody else in the whole world and i'm not interested in anything else and those people come up with amazing finds that that little piece of the puzzle then can be taken by others and set into the broader picture and we have a sharper image because of their specialization so they're really i mean it's um it's a it's a dialectic in some ways you know, and, and in fact, sometimes you can't become a specialist in that one thing until you see the bigger picture well enough to say, "There's this is lacking. I need, somebody needs to drill down here and find out what's underneath because we think we know, but we don't know as well as we ought to know. And I'm going to be the one that figures that out. You know, there's a dialectical relationship between that or, or some kind of symbiotic relationship. I don't know what the metaphor you want to use. Drawing back to when you said you wanted to make the switch into Assyriology because you didn't actually want to go into the Hebrew Bible anymore because it's been done to death and all these people will just write monograph after monograph after one little verse. I'm curious, though, has there been anything done, in your opinion, in Assyriology that is like, it seems like the most popular thing that you could almost say approaches sort of a done to death and we should stop doing that. Or is it still such a small and, and hard to get into feel that there's nothing actually we feel that has not been overanalyzed? I don't know. I'm thinking more of being a classicist. I, the last thing I wanted to do, even though I loved it, was Homer because I'm like, everyone does Homer. Everyone does poetry. Well, yeah, I mean... I mean, so the mythological material attracts a lot of attention, Gilgamesh and Numelish, these kinds of things. But done to death, I don't think so, because, so, you know, I, I wrote a survey of Akkadian literature, and when you go and look for bibliography on these myths, I, I've talked to a seriologist, and they'll say, oh, you know, I, those texts are just, everybody's writing on those texts. Everybody is a, a few dozen, you know. Like, I remember spending a bunch of time uh, on the, the electronic uh, catalog for, for the University of, of Chicago's Institute for the Ancient Study, ISAC, of the ancient, of ancient, Institute for the Study of Ancient Civilizations. They changed their name recently. And I remember spending a lot of time going through the titles of journal articles. And I would, I just, I had a list of, of journals that I was going to look at, peer reviewed journals in the field. And then they very conveniently put the title, the, the titles of all the articles for every issue. And you, there was a pattern that I could just go back like 20 years. So I had a list of the mythological texts. And, you know, so I started collating, essentially looking for things I hadn't seen before I hadn't read. Now, this is not the only way to do a literature search, of course, but, and I did end up missing some things because of Feshrift and unedited volumes and other things. But it, to me, it's really surprising how little. If you had done that for biblical material, and, and, and I was doing this for all of Gilgamesh. Let's say you wanted to do that for just, say, the Book of Amos, a minor prophet, very short. You would have ended up with probably thousands of articles in the last 20 years. For Gilgamesh, you know, I, I, dozens. And so I don't think anything's been done to death, personally. Um, now, there are seriologists who will say, oh, so-and-so is working on this. I want to work on something different. Because there's a sense of being a pioneer in the field. I want to do something no one else has worked on, or I want to do something that the last text edition was 1960 or 1970. So it's been 50 years, it's been 60 years. I want to do something like that. There are some things, you know, I I thought it was really strange when I started working on Ludlow, Bill Namiki, there hadn't been a text edition for 50 years. And as soon as I I worked on it with Amara News from uh, Tartu University, in Estonia. And when we published in 2010, when, within four years, there was another text edition. 
And within nine years, there was another text edition. <laughs> but that's how fields go. You know, when, when Andrew George published his edition of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh studies took off even more. Likewise with the new Elish. And so the field experiences these, these bursts, you know, of creativity and scholarship around something because a new text edition appeared or a new project has gotten off the ground. But I don't think anything's really been done to death. Others might might disagree. The Akkadian prayers, this is what I'm working on right now, the Babylonian prayers, they've been done a lot. And sometimes I feel like I'm just coming along and picking up, you know, little morsels that have been left behind. But I don't think they've been done to death. You know, translated a lot. Yeah, maybe I'm not going to come up with a new translation. But, you know, that's not all there is to do with ancient texts. And, and that's the thing. If you say, has Gilgamesh been translated too much? Should we get another translation? Well, it's not like the Bible. It's not like Homer. We could use another one, sure. But there's so much more to do that I don't think anything in Assyriology has been done to death. There's so many new perspectives. But, you know, do a seriologist ask those kinds of questions? That's the other, that's a little bit, frankly, of an issue. Not, not always. Well, I mean, it's interesting because you say, okay, the prayers, they've been done a lot. But the funny thing is, only someone within the field would know that because as someone outside of the field of seriology, I've heard of one person doing it. I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. Did not know they were done a lot. So, and then there's the perception, right, yeah. from like the general public that Gilgamesh would be the thing that you could technically say was done to death. At the same time, we're always complaining about how, why don't we have more translations? What do you mean I have to get this one that is considered kind of the best? There's not multiple options. Like I can't find 50 different translations of the Iliad. You know, that's easy, but. Yeah. And then even even so, if, even if you've translated and done work with Gilgamesh, the public still doesn't really know about it because we don't also have things sort of propping it up, right? We don't have a billion media adaptations. We don't have, I don't know. Do you know, I, I think there was like a Gilgamesh either film or something done a very long time ago, but uh, it was it would have been done there have been different there have been different theatrical musical kind of whatever um adaptations we do now have gilgamesh in penguin classics andrew george 1999 i think ben foster from yale has a norton uh, translation for gilgamesh and i think that's kind of that might actually be a litmus test if you've got a penguins classic or norton critical edition or norton edition of a particular poem from the ancient world then maybe you could say that it's not been done to death, but it, it's hit an, an important milestone in its cultural relevance or something uh, or perception of cultural relevance. I don't think there's anything else from ancient Mesopotamia that's had a Penguin or a Norton translation. And so, I don't know, I think there's lots to be done. I've actually thought a lot about producing an anthology of prayers that not published, so I'm under contract to do something with Society of Biblical Literature Press. SBL Press is going to publish eventually, if I can get it done, on something on so-called Shuila prayers, the hand-raising prayers. So I'm on the hook to do that. But I think that it, I've always been thought it would be really fun to do something with an anthology of prayers not meant for seriologists with the footnotes that say, this is the Babylonian where blah, 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 but rather for the general public. But is there a market for that? I don't know. I think there is. I think there's a market. And even if it's small, it's growing. Because when I'm thinking of media that exposes people beyond just, just book form, right? The thing that comes to mind, also because I just played it, it's a, it's a horror series, funnily enough. But the Dark Pictures Anthology Games did a game called House of Ashes and it's all based on like Sumerian mythology um, based loosely off of the Curse of Akkad and it, I mean it's visually it's gorgeous it takes place underground it's like in a temple and they put a ton of mythology in the game you know it's like simplified yeah but I can't tell you how many people have who I've spoken to about it, who have played it, have said, you know, I didn't know a lot about it, but this game was amazing and it made me want to learn more, but also I don't want to just read a stuffy edition. Can you point me to good literature where I can learn more about the premise for the game? And being from outside the field, I said, 
I actually didn't really know anything about the Curse of Akkad, except that there was a text called Curse of Akkad where it roughly told me about Naramsen or whatever. And so I was like, oh, man. You gave the specialist answer. I don't know anything about that. Yeah, so I was like, oh, no, I don't know anything about this. So then I started to do research and tried to find more. Now, luckily, I do have access to a lot of academics places, JSTOR, that general public members may not. And so I was able to find things. But I did think to myself after playing this game that, like, Curse of Akkad is such an interesting narrative. Why do we not have this adapted or made into something cool like you like you could do a cool trade book on it and and imagine being someone there you don't even have to be the main like a main person but like that's the kind of thing that I feel like being as one of the lay people right this is where the interest is bubbling so that and then just do more films or put more into games it's interesting that you mentioned the game thing. And I remember that's the, the initial, uh, when you initially contacted me, you mentioned that. So we have a program at University of the Pacific here called Media X, and it has this kind of, it's fairly wide open. You can go into media studies, like criticism, you can go into media studies and do like production, and that is management and be in part, you know, and then there's like the creative stream. So there's like three different streams you can choose. And I had no idea this was going. I mean, my son is one of the first graduates from the program. My middle, my middle kid. Anyway, I so my son is like, hey, he works at the university right now, and he said, hey, did you hear about this guy in Media X doing Gilgamesh? And I said, what? He's like, yeah, he's producing a video game in like for a senior project or whatever. And he said, I was over, you know, checking out because I'm an alum of the program. I was over there looking at the projects, and and he said, I met the guy and and told him. We have a specialist on campus who does this. I think the reaction at University of Pacific, which is very health focused and relatively small in terms of the humanities and unfortunately shrinking sometimes, it seems like the reaction of people is we have that here. I mean, I literally, the, the former president who who was replaced a few years ago, when I first met her, she literally said, we have that here <laughs> to me, to my face. Um, and so it was really cool to me con to connect to this student who was working on a video game that was essentially utilizing and adapting various elements from the Gilgamesh narrative and, and cycles and stories. You know, there's more than one Gilgamesh story. And, um, and so there is sort of, there is an interest. And it was, you know, it was also frustrating because so often the, the interest is that that hunger is satiated by Googling something. Old translations, in Egyptology, it would be the equivalent of finding Budge's translation of something, you know, and you're just like, oh my God, Budge. You know, so it's really strange for people to go, oh, this book was published in 1975, but then you're like, no, it was copyrighted in 1892. This is so bad, it's not even wrong. That's like the worst insult you can have in academia. This is so bad. It's not even just wrong. You know, it's just so, so bad. No, I, I get what you're saying. And so they're, especially among, it seems like video games, they're looking for creative material. They're looking to do something different and new. And so they look to the ancient world for some reason. Um, yeah. And if anybody's out there creating a game on ancient Mesopotamia and wants to uh, to pay a consultant, I'm willing. <laughs> yes, that's what we need. Well, I want to I want to stick with the media theme then. I, I, out of all the different reception -y materials we have for the ancient world, if there is one, do you have one in mind that represents and we can go further afield. Just ancient Mesopotamia, well in your opinion, or are they all just kind of bad? Wait, do we have any media representation that does it well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that you would recommend to people because, you know, it's not terrible. Or, you know, the, the other way we could go is, or are there no media adaptations that really do it justice and we should just create new things because everything we have is terrible? Media representations of ancient Mesopotamia are actually very few that I know of. I know that there, there was a volume that was edited by some European scholars. One of them, I think, was Lorenzo Verdarame uh, at, in Rome. And they have seen and analyzed a couple different 
media representations, I don't think anything is really centered specifically on a particular retelling recently that I can think of. I'm going to pull the specialist thing and say, I'm not really a specialist in the reception of Mesopotamian pop culture or in, in media in general. There are some interesting things, though, that pop out every now and then. You know, in a horror movie, Pazuzu, this demon that's very well known, pops up. Or I remember watching the Robin Williams when he played, he had voiced the genie, right, in the movie, in the animated Aladdin. There was uh, the, the Cave of Wonders or something like that, you know. And it was interesting when they panned across all the, the stashed loot that there was some Assyrian looking artifacts stashed there. And you'll see that kind of thing now and then. But I, I don't know of anything that's really centered. There are a couple of things that are kind of fun. In the UK, I've not seen her play, but Selena Wisnom, who is an Assyriologist and also um, has a background in classics, has done, I think she's done a production of one of the myths. I'm, can't, I'm trying to think which one it was. I'm not going to say because I'll probably be wrong. But Selena Wisnom has tried to do this, but I like I haven't I haven't attended. Martin Worthington, who teaches in Dublin, made a YouTube video, a little ancient folktale. He did Eternals. Poor Man of Nippur, of course. The Poor Man of Nippur. He did a YouTube version of that. And it's kind of campy. And uh, my doctoral dissertation advisor, Sia Bush, is in it. Um, and so, so every now and then you see these famous scholars who are doing their initial acting role in a movie. But, you know, an actual mainstream, well-budgeted, commercially produced, I don't know of one, but there are attempts. I think Scott Nagel, who is a professor at University of Washington, has done some kind of film of one of the myths as well. But these are all kind of hobbyists and, you know, they're not, they're not producers, they're not filmmakers. Um, you're looking probably for something more mainstream and I, I don't know of it. I just don't know. I mean, it can be non-mainstream. I just, I probably wouldn't be aware of it as someone who, that's not my specialty. Yeah. But I, I, if that's all you have, I would still refer people to non-mainstream because it's better than nothing. Yeah. But I guess the only thing that came to mind for me was Martin Worthington consulted for the Marvel Eternals and he did, he wrote the Babylonian dialogue for the sequences in Babylon. I just don't follow the Marvel it gets talked a lot about in my household because my my two youngest will talk quite a bit about it. Noah is in media studies, and so he'll go and pick apart the films, and his younger brother, they talk about it. But I didn't know that, actually, and it's funny because Martin and I correspond every now and then, and, and but he would have been the person to write the Babylonian dialogue for sure. He's, he's, uh, he's perfect for that. <laughs> I'll have to look up a YouTube clip with the Babylonian to see how it sounds. You know, he has, he had an interesting project. I think he has since moved on from it where he asked various Assyriologists to read an extended, maybe a hundred lines of Babylonian and record them. And so it's interesting to hear, you know, a, a German Assyriologist versus an Israeli German, uh, Israeli Assyriologist, for example, read Babylonian, like a poem or a passage of Gilgamesh or of Anume Elish or something. Because, of course, we have no recordings. We don't really know for sure. And individuals, they'll bring their own kind of accent. <laughs> their own flair, let's say. Yeah. Well, and you know, where to put the stresses, I mean, we've got fairly good agreement on that, but to actually do it properly, there's not a strong tradition of reading Babylonian out loud like there is in Hebrew, uh, biblical Hebrew, you know, in class, you would read out loud, Latin, Greek, I assume, you know, let's read it out loud. In Akkadian, we read it out loud, but there wasn't like, wait, stop, you put the accent in the wrong spot. It was mostly just start the text you know it is interesting i'll have to look for that the eternals it's funny yeah i don't watch a ton of marvel but i had several friends who love it just say if you're a fan of ancient history in the ancient world you have to watch this because it has extended sequences all throughout history in different ancient time periods and i said okay so i did give it a watch and i did love it and mm. uh, so it was it was pretty spectacular okay 
as a specialist in the field that in a field that a lot of people don't feel super familiar that they are super familiar with and with a lot of names that can be easily confused and like any ancient culture there's probably a lot of names that are reused so in your opinion who are like I don't know let's say three most important figures that you would like people to know of and and I think let's we can take Hammurabi out of it because we have the law code but we can take him out of it but you know I think I only would really say I I know of like Naramsin and I know of like Sargon and I'm all over the map with chronology. So I want to ask an expert, who do you think we as the general public should be aware of? Well, okay. So I I thought I heard two different questions. One, it sounds like what should people know? And then the other, I thought at first you were saying, what do people mostly know? So in terms of familiarity in the modern world, you took Hammurabi off the table. Let's take Gilgamesh off the table. The two that you named, I probably wouldn't have. I mean, eh, maybe Sargon, maybe Naram Sin, maybe Ashurbanipal, I think might come up. People in the Bay Area are always surprised to learn. Even some of the seriologists that I in the area were surprised when I told them there's a statue of Ashurbanipal in front of the public library in San Francisco, the main branch. Yeah. And this is an interesting connection because an Assyrian Christian artist is the one who created Ashurbanipal. And modern Assyrian Christians are very interested in ancient Mesopotamian history. And so here in California, where there's a fairly large Assyrian Christian population that came over from the Middle East, they're very proud and they have these organizations. And and so Ashurbanipal seems like one that people do or should, because he also is the person, the the, the king behind one of the, the great libraries of the ancient world in Nineveh and the discovery of the, the archives, you know, plural archives and libraries, plural in the 19th century is really what got the field off to a start. And those archives and libraries continue to be very instrumental in the advancement of seriology as a field. So Ashurbanipal, both do people know him? Yes. Should people know him? Yes. Nebuchadnezzar, I think, is another one. Nebuchadnezzar II, of course, not the first, is a very important, the, the most important Neo-Babylonian king, of course, infamous for the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 or thereabouts. And so in terms of pop culture, if you, I don't know if you know anything about the Matrix movies, but I was really surprised to see that the Nebuchadnezzar was the name of the ship, right? That they flew around and saving people from being plugged into the Matrix. Do people know? Yes. Should people know? Probably because the destruction of Jerusalem in the in the sixth century was actually a pivotal moment for Western civilization in a strange way, because that destruction of Jerusalem probably was one of the most important events for the distillation and the crystallization of the redaction and editing of the Hebrew Bible, which of course is is foundational to so many elements in our cultures today, cultures plural. Other persons should or do know, I think we've got all the biggies. You know, in terms of pop culture, the movie Contact um, with Jodie Foster and Matthew McConaughey. Now you're this is this is from the '90s. Okay, I'm going back to like when I used to watch a lot of movies. I I don't watch so many now. I read the novel. Carl Sagan wrote the novel Contact, and I heard in the movie a couple little Assyrian things, like the bad guy, the billionaire who finances Jodie Foster's project. Um, his name is S. R. Haddon, which is in fact. It sounds very similar to an ancient Neo-Assyrian king, Esarhaddon. And if you go to the novel, a number of things come up. Gilgamesh comes up. Uh, ancient Mesopotamia comes up. Uh, there is the billionaire Esarhaddon is there. He has an, an adult amusement, amusement park called Babylon. And it's this decadent kind of hedonistic, definitely, you know, NC-17 or, or, or X-rated and it's after hours partying. But yeah, so, you know, of course, not a figure, but Babylon, the city, sort of continues to be associated with decadence and sin. So yeah, of course, the king Nebuchadnezzar is the epitome of that evil. The evil king of Babylon goes and destroys the holy city of Jerusalem. I don't know. Can you think of any others? Uh, 
I mean, we could talk about Cyrus, but he's Persian. Yeah, he's more Persian. But he's come up in an interesting way because the of the former president, President Trump's association and evangelical political discourse, they have likened him to Cyrus. Ooh. I know, I see, I see your reaction, but um it's very it's very interesting because of course Cyrus was this non-Jewish king who proclaims the right of return for for the exiled Jewish people and he finances the building of that second temple initially at least you can read about this in Ezra Nehemiah the end of Chronicles Cyrus is called the anointed one a Moshiach in Hebrew in second Isaiah and so there's this idea that he is this figure like Nebuchadnezzar who you know through providential ordering of events Yahweh uses to punish Jerusalem Nebuchadnezzar Cyrus is the converse he's the non-Jewish despot you know this this terrible guy that is used providentially by Yahweh to save and to to return his people and so although not Mesopotamian definitely I mean Cyrus walks into Babylon takes it over in the sixth century he is a figure from ancient Mesopotamian history that has been quite prominent in our political discourse these last several years. For one, I can see the parallel, although I'm going to hazard a guess that Cyrus actually believed, strongly believed in what he was doing, as opposed to the other one who I don't know. he saw probably as just an expedient way. So I don't know if he really believed, who can say. But and I have to ask the Persian specialists on that, but I, I would caution that we probably don't know as much about Cyrus and his heart as we would like to. And I would also suggest that ancient Mes ancient kings in general, Mesopotamian, Persian, or, or Israelite, Judean, Egyptian, Hittite, they were politicians too, you know? That's true, it's true. They're pragmatic too. <laughs> yeah, that's true. No, we can't completely disconnect. And they were still human. We share and do a lot of the things that the ancients did and vice versa so that's true we, yeah. we it's it's sort of a dangerous game of supposition and uh, but no i can't think of any other truly mesopotamian figures that either we should or do know of here's one that you're going to say is not ancient mesopotamian but i'm going to say that you're wrong alexander the great so alexander the great is of course not ancient mesopotamian but he died in babylon most people don't know this. Most people think of Alexander the Great as a Greek, right? Way over there in the in the Aegean realm. But in fact, of course, he conquered all this big giant swath of Western Asia, North Africa, and all that stuff. And he dies in Babylon, making him in some ways, you know, one of the most important last Babylonian kings. That's something that I, I most people just do not think of him as associated with Mesopotamia, but he's actually quite important. That one's also hard because since he did conquer half the known world, yeah. he was proclaimed king is in, in so many different places. So I, I suppose if you think about Macedonia and Greece, you're like, OK, warlord, king, sort of great. And then you say, oh, OK, well, yes, he did conquer like the Middle East. So then he was king and he was in Babylon. But then he also went down to Egypt and he was crowned Pharaoh. So he's a hard one because you could you could use him in multiple instances. But it is true. But if you ask about figures, you know, ancient Mesopotamian figures, it's all about how you define it. Right. And if you name Alexander the Great, there's something about naming something that's not intuitive that makes people go, wait, what? No. And then you say, yes, but not really. And then you say it's about definition. And then suddenly there's this new perspective on him that he he dies in Babylon. Now, just as an analogy, if a very beloved American president in a decade or two dies while on vacation in some other city, you can't deny the fact, say, you know, I'm going to use an example and, and may he live from, you know, a, another half a century. Let's say President Obama dies in San Francisco. There's going to be a monument. They're going to say in some way he's ours, you know, in a different way than he was before. He was here. This was his final place. And so that's kind of what I'm doing with Alexander the Great. And, you know, there's also a little bit of subversiveness there because traditionally Assyriology has said, and this is not true in the last few decades, but we stop at Alexander the Great. And now the Hellenistic study of the Near East 
has really taken off because there's certain people have done certain things and like anything else, when a few people get going on something, it starts attracting more attention. And so now the Hellenistic Near East and the cuneiform tradition associated with that, not just the Greek and Persian, has really taken off. And so, yeah, I'm going to say Alexander the Great, <laughs> important Babylonian figure. <laughs> That's a great one. I mean, I mean, let's be real. Most people outside of the field are not going to know that Assyria had a king list like in Egypt. If you didn't know that, you do now. Assyria had a king list. But yeah, if I were to look at the king list, I'd be like, yeah, I recognize three names, four names, tops, and then say. Yeah, I mean, there's there's people in there that we don't know anything about. You know, if you go to this this project, the Royal Inscriptions of, of Mesopotamia, they have all these volumes. And every now and then you'll flip and you'll say, oh, this guy. And we have like five texts from him, you know, and then the next guy has a whole volume. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of obscure. I mean, that's what we had expect in the ancient world. There's all kinds of obscurities. And then suddenly a floodlight opens up on a century and then it goes dim for a little while. But it's interesting how we have a lot of things combined in media where like, OK, you'll learn a name. So like your example, The Matrix, where you might not know anything about the actual real Nebuchadnezzar, but you know that Morpheus's ship is named the Nebuchadnezzar. So you go, oh, OK, well, I guess I know something from there. But it's interesting because the Miyazaki film Castle in the Sky it has cuneiform in it, like the actual tablet that the guy, the evil dude reads. It's all cuneiform. And so you see that and you go, oh my gosh, this is so cool. So we seem to like to put a lot of references yeah. to Mesopotamia in a lot of things and then not explain it. You just see the thing and go, oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah. You know, some of this is an attempt to be esoteric or exotic or something like that, right? There's this kind of, it's sort of the equivalent of Easter eggs in video games, right? I've heard this. There are these things that you can discover that are not part of the main story, perhaps. It's just, you know, it's tucked away in somewhere. So finding cuneiform or finding that Assyrian art in the background of that animated thing or using that name of, for a demon in that horror movie, they're almost like Easter eggs. It's almost like you think somebody on that writing team or that production crew took a class somewhere at some school that he mostly forgot what they learned there, but they know that one thing. <laughs> I mean, that's the way creatives work. You know, they've got their thing and then they're going to almost use other elements as ornaments or as icing on the cake, to use a different metaphor. That's okay with me because if someone says, oh, that's cuneiform, it could lead to them, you know, becoming the next great cuneiformist. This is how Egyptology has attracted so many people to the field, right? I would very much enjoy seeing you try to spot how many Easter eggs were put in House of Ashes <laughs> just because I feel like it would be a lot. I'll have to take a look. Because they make Pazuzu like a huge thing for the market. And actually, Pazuzu is on the cover of the game. Is that right? Huh. Which is something you don't see very often because I had a lot of friends be like, wait, what is this on the front of this game? And I was like, it's it's a demon. Mm -hmm. It's it's so cool. And the game, the dialogue, the way it was written, they did such a good job of informing you who it was, what it was in an accurate manner, but also in a way where they don't lose you right. within the game. Right. So It's not a boring lecture. Yeah, like it really, <laughs> it really was one of the better things I've seen that incorporates... Sumerian history and mythology and literally one of my favorite things is like one of the clues you find in the game is an actual book on Sumerian mythology that I wish existed I'm 99.9% .9 sure it's not a real book they just like designed some cool book in game and then the like the name of the author I tried to look it up just in case it was an easter egg no it's a completely made up name uh. which made me very sad because I thought to myself this is a book that I would buy because it seems really cool you thought it was product placement <laughs> I did and I was like please tell me what is this book where do I get it it had all the pertinent information specifically on rituals for the dead and what happened and then there were other like little things in the game that talked more about the curse of Akkad and I was like okay but is this real because unlike maybe 90% of who they're catering to I am that nerd who will be like okay great so like can I read this is it real yeah. <laughs> and yeah none of it was real and I was very sad uh, now I want someone to look at this game 
and then take that and then write a paper on it talk about what's right and expand because it needs to be done and i wish i could do it myself (laughs) but not a specialist so one day someone take this material please please and do something with it but yeah i think the, the thing i love most is just like with any kind of media there's so many different kinds of media that you can do something yeah there's that wonderful song by they might be giants called the mesopotamians that i love i don't know this <laughs> oh my gosh okay well for for anyone who's not Yes, for anyone who's not aware, there's a fantastic song by They Might Be Giants called The Mesopotamians. And like the entire chorus is the names of four very well-known figures that we have from either history or mythology. Mm. And I think everyone should listen to it because it's also just a really fun song. I'm going to write it down. Yes, everyone go listen to it. It's amazing. Uh, In the chorus, it goes Sargon, Hammurabi, Ashurbanipal, and Gilgamesh. It's those four. Yep. Yep. We got all of them. Anyway, the media section, there's so much that we could sit here and talk about it, but we'd be like 100 years old. I got to cut us off somewhere, even though I wish we could keep going. So at the end of the interview portion, there's just a couple of questions I like to finish off with. The first of which is when you were a student, did you attend your professor's office hours? And these can be either formal office hours or some sort of like informal situation as well. This is strange, but I don't remember them ever talking about office hours. I remember going to my ancient, my Koine Greek professor's office. It was because of a controversy. (laughs) I won't go into it, but yeah. No worries. And it's unfortunate, but I honestly, I don't remember them ever talking about office hours. So I did get to know some of my professors fairly well. My wife and I got married really, really early, and one of our professors served as the minister, so that was cool. I think, you know, it's funny. I talk to my students all the time about my office hours and say, hey, if you got a question, come to office hours. And guess how many students on a, on average come to office hours every week? Nobody. 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 I mean, and we're a small university that prides herself in being student-centered. And I keep telling them, you guys are paying for all these services, it's ridiculous how much tuition is in the United States for college, and you're not going to use them? Come on, come and pick my brain. And then occasionally I get the person who comes to office and just sits. I'm like, hi. I'm like, oh, what's your question today? What, what's what's going on? Oh, I'm just, you know, I got a half an hour to kill before my next class. I thought I'd just come in. I literally had someone do this like six <laughs> times in the semester. And I'm like, well, I, I think I'll just keep working if you don't have anything to talk about. <laughs> Oh, gosh, it was torturous. <laughs> oh, dear. But that's very oh, rare. Dear. You know, and, and, and okay. I do get students who come. And I think it is important. If So if you're an undergraduate and the professor says they have office hours and you genuinely want to pick their brain and have questions, you should go. They literally have to be there for those hours. They're supposed to drop everything and be there for you. So go and ask questions, not just like what's on the test, but other questions. Yeah. Well, okay. So you can, uh, you can draw on your experience as an educator if you didn't go to yours because you just don't remember them having them. But do you have like a, I don't know, like a favorite memory or something that happened that was kind of fun, something that stands out about a conversation, anything kind of fun? In undergrad? You can choose from wherever, what stage you can even choose as the professor, like did a student come in and you just had something that was particularly interesting that stood out to you? I mean, you can choose it from whenever. I don't know that I have anything that really stands out as a student. I mean, probably a lot of conversations were formative and very important. You know, putting me on the spot at the moment, can I identify one right now? In terms of my own office hour experiences as a professor talking with students, the times that have been most poignant is when I have an international student who's come from a country that has been devastated by war or or other problems and economic collapse or something and their english is very poor but you know in my writing my classes are writing intensive typically and a lot of times they'll come in and we'll do line edits together and i'll try to help them see you know english is kind of a strange language it's been very poignant when they and i say what are you going to do with your degree and they say i'm going to go back to my country and rebuild i've had a number of students from other countries and one in particular from afghanistan And it's been very, very gratifying to see him, you know, go on, do an MBA and be that kind of leader. You know, that's really, really cool. Oh, 
Yeah. That's, that's so lovely. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, and so unexpected because I was... I, the reason I asked this question is just because... I, I wasn't actually a problem student at all, but I like to pretend that I was because I didn't leave my professor's office. I, I, if I could, I would have slept in their office <laughs> and I'm sure that they were like, go home, go away, stop being here. I've had some of those and, you know, it, you get all kinds. <laughs> I've been teaching in here at Pacific for 17 years. And so, yeah, you get all kinds. But I didn't want to tell a horror story. I have horror stories. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay yeah i mean i'm sure everyone does i mean working in academia for a very long time yeah. <laughs> you, you you get things yeah. you you have tales so yeah well and then normally i would end with some sort of version of why should students attend office hours but i feel like you've covered that yeah. pretty well yeah. so i would say we can get into our poem reading so at the end of each podcast i ask each guest if they would read shelley's ozymandias poem and then since it is a cold reading if i could get your thoughts on you know what do you think of this poem this is a poem that a lot of people kind of cite or talk about as being either really cool or influential or they can't really put their thumb on why it seems to have a cool vibe so i'd just be interested to know if you either agree disagree any kind of thoughts okay so i'm going to read it first i met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkled legs of stone stand in the desert near them on the sand half sunk a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that it sculptor well those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things the hand that mocked them in the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. It is humbling. Obviously, you know, there's a romantic, there's a romantic element here, right? Clearly, there's this ancient, it's like a ruin, you know, and I think the 19th century, and I, I don't know Percy's exact years, but I think 19th century. Wrote it in 1818. Okay. So it, there's this kind of interest in the the ruins of former civilizations, right? And it wasn't just Greece and Rome, but it was starting to be Western Asia, North Africa, and some of these things are starting to go on display. I think the British Museum starts to show the first artifacts from Ritchie's collection from the Near East around this time of the early 19th century, maybe a little bit later than 1818. I think there's this romanticization of the ancient world, but there's also, and this is probably really everybody says this, looking at this ancient king, king of kings, and he's gone. But he's not gone exactly, right? There's this ruin. What's most essential about the personality is gone. He's not interacting. He's not flesh and blood. He's not walking and talking. And yet he is communicating, right? There's something interesting there. And it's, and it's actually very Near Eastern. Because if you think about the great Akkadian kings of ancient Mesopotamia, they leave the stele, these inscriptions, that are copied for about 2,000 years or that maybe not quite 2,000 years, but for millennia. There's also that, I'm looking at this first line, and I, you know, I've never read this poem before. I met a traveler from an antique land. This is also very 19th century travel log kind of thing. Uh, it's like ancient mariner. It's like, even if you go back to Thomas More's Utopia, it's got this, there's this European idea that there are these explorers and they're coming back with these exotic tales of the other. And so it's not just the artifact, but it's also the traveler and bringing this exotic stuff and essentially telling the European or the, the person in Europe or, or UK or wherever, you guys think you're great. It's all been done before. And here's the pillars and, and here are the ruins from these places. Very astute, I would agree. I mean, I think the, the last thing I was looking to say was essentially get over yourself. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I completely agree. I, you look at the era in which it was written. You think about what Shelley was going for. Yeah, I mean, this is an incredibly political statement by Shelley, honestly. You know, I've always read this poem. It's been my favorite poem since at least high school. Mm -hmm. Maybe earlier, but I can't remember when I first read it. But definitely high school. It's a memento mori to humans, to, yeah. to all of us, to remember that we will die. It's like Gilgamesh in that respect. Go survey the walls. You know, this is going to be your legacy, but just realize that we're ashes and we're dust. Yes, exactly. These are like very potent themes, right? And you have the idea of legacy and monumentality and all these things kind of wrapped into 14 short lines, which is very impressive to do. And it's very evocative. Yeah, I feel like a, I feel like a moron for having to admit that I don't think I've ever read this. Maybe I read it in some English literature class a million years ago, but I just don't recall it. But it's interesting. It was very formative for you. Reading it was like, wow, this is something. Yeah, yeah. I it definitely was one of the most impactful things that I think I read in high school. And that's the thing, though, because, I mean, I don't know if that's a question of are you influenced by, like, a certain teacher who likes things so then if they make you read stuff then it'll stick with you versus is something as universal as we think because maybe maybe Osmandius is not as universal as I think it is I just happen to be surrounded by people who even if they haven't read it they were like aware of it or modern pop cultural references kind of to it because they use the name Ozymandias or something. So yeah, that's a, that's a good question in and of itself. How, how widely known is it? How popular is it? Well, I'll probably spend the rest of my day thinking about this and second guessing my, my own interpretations. <laughs> that's how I work. <laughs> I But like, I have seen this poem, been around this poem for many, many years now. And I still, every time I podcast or speak to someone who's read it, I still learn new things. Just know you could think all day about it. And yet if you spend every day thinking about it, you would still find new things. So it's it's that deep. In the vein of just kind of thinking about the themes of the poem here, though, the last question I ask every single guest on the podcast is, if you think for a moment about our contemporary society, like right now, do we have a modern Ozymandias, a modern equivalent, something that we think is so great and amazing that will be here forever, lasting legacy. But realistically, will it still be around like 500 years from now? Will, will, will humans that far in the future have the same opinion? I don't know. So I think a lot of the artifacts that we love so much are digital in nature or, or on, uh, on very perishable things. Structures, you know, I think of the ending of the 19, what, 68 Planet of the Apes with the, the Tower, or the, the Statue of Liberty. I think we have those kinds of things like the Statue of Liberty, the Bay Area, the, the, the Golden Gate Bridge, for example, here in California, or, you know, the, the Washington Monument or something like this. I think people think those will stand forever. But I think a lot of our artifacts are digital and perishable and you know they will pro many of these things will be lost i think uh, many of them will be lost i sometimes the thing that stands as monumental in my own mind about americans is the the continued exceptionalistic mindset which is not a monument but that mindset of you know we're the best you read and clearly we're not um, I was just reading an article in the New York Times about how many unnecessary deaths there are in America, deaths of despair, deaths uh, by accident, by gunfire, neglect, and you know, all kinds of things. That's probably not what you're looking for since a mindset is not the same. But generally speaking, we're not a people given to historical reflection. And so there isn't a sense of humility that in 500 years, we're not going to be the top of the heap like we think we are now. I mean, and all you got to do is look across the Atlantic to the UK. It wasn't that long ago that they ruled the sea. They ruled the world and, you know, this little bitty island. And it's just not the case. I think it would be really good for us to think about a poem like this more broadly. And even if not with regard to material culture, but with regard to our mindset. No, I think that's a fantastic answer. And it's, uh, I don't think it's one that I've gotten before. I mean... I get such a wide range of answers, which is why I love this question. But I think the closest one to you, I got someone said the Pax Americana. And I was yeah. like, 
yup that's gone or will be soon it's ending yeah. but yeah no i think uh mindset is is a perfectly valid answer and one that i will definitely take with me and think about because i think it is it is very true we don't really have the sort of humility that we probably should in reflection um and yeah. it is quite funny to hear these days people optimistically talking about how we're we're America, so we're going to last forever and be the best and nothing is going to take us down and then point to any student of history yeah. and they say, well, Rome, I'm sure, thought the same thing. Yeah, and it's really, you know, I'm in a history department now and I'll be teaching world history um, in the coming years instead of religious studies and stuff. Um, it's it's kind of strange. So I've been reading this summer and I just finished A History of the Silk Road and Western China is an interesting conglomeration of all these different people groups and all these different dynasties and powers and conflicting cultures and economic interests and all this. And it's really remarkable that the Silk Road, probably everybody's heard about this. And at the same time, it's it's a has-been. You know, it's a total has-been. And, and Western China is very much a problematic area for the current communist regime, you know, government. And it was just really interesting to read because there are arguments about heritage that they're having now. How do they commemorate this? What kind of statues, uh, what kind of, where does the Silk Road start? Who gets to claim we're first? And it's interesting because it's like the present is, uh, is looking to the past to affirm something about the present, utilizing the past, and in some ways papering over some of the atrocities of this group or that person or whatever. And the same thing is happening here in the United States with regard to the Confederacy, or with about, uh, in terms of who gets memorialized. We argue, we want to argue, but we so often forget that the best way to think through these issues is to actually think about the history and then to ask the questions, why do we want to commemorate this? So heritage studies is actually, I think, super relevant. If we're going to talk about an ancient, about ancient history being relevant to the, the modern world, go be an ancient historian, get your degrees, and then think about and become a consultant for or get involved in government or organizations that are interested in this issue of heritage, not just preservation, but utilization, right? The kind of museum element or the, the display element, because it's very political, but it can have such an important impact on the, the, the self-awareness, but also identity of people. Of everything you just said because that's literally what I did. I spent five years in school getting my classics degree and then I just finished my master's and I did my thesis on the impact of Islamic iconoclasm on cultural heritage policy in Turkey. So I'm like, that's literally my wheelhouse. Cool. Oh, that, I love being on that same wavelength. But yes, I agree. Culture, like heritage studies is huge. 20 years ago, I would have thought I'm an ancient historian. I'm not interested in politics at all. You know, I just let me be in my little cubicle and study my thing. And it was really naive. Maybe not 20, but maybe longer because I forget how old I am and I'm old. But yeah, I think that that element needs to be brought out more, you know. And so when I teach these history classes now, one of the, one of the assignments I often do is, um, all right, so we learned about this in the ancient world. How is it being utilized in the, in the contemporary world? And so bring in articles. Let's talk about this. And we, we have these sessions where people bring in stuff from the media and you realize that this stuff is being deployed. And I'm going to use that word because we often use it with military, right? The, the ancient world is often deployed as a, an offensive or as a proactive mechanism to mobilize people. And again, the military word around some political issue. And sometimes this is good, depending on your politics. And other times it's really, truly horrendous. And you think of the, the white supremacy groups that are using classicists as in classical scholarship as a, as a vehicle right to push their their supremacy agenda which is like a nightmare oh it's it's so upsetting but that's why we need scholars out there doing the good work and other people of course okay one last question for you and that is where can people find you if people want to follow your work or i don't know send you an email and reach out I've recently moved my office of 17 years from downstairs in WPC, Window Phillips Center, to upstairs in WPC, Window Phillips Center, at University of the Pacific. I'm here every day, actually, nine to five, uh, even through the summer, unless I'm out hiking or uh, away. So physically, I'm in Stockton, California. 
on our main campus. We have three campuses and main campuses in Stockton. So hit me up if you're in Stockton, drop by, say hi. I'm online. You can Google Alan Lindsay. I'm currently in a fight with Google because of the subtitle that they've given me, which is they call me an Orientalist, which is a terrible 19th Mm. century term. And it comes to find out it's very difficult to remove that subtitle. And so I've actually filed a legal notice with them. But I'm online. You can Google me. I I have an academia.edu site where not all, but quite a bit of my scholarship is available. Several of my books are published open access. So my most recent book, uh, Monograph on Lidlow Belnamiki, is actually open access PDF. Um, And my book that I edited on Acadian Prayers is open access through SBL Press. I mean, I have shuilas.org and I have my Acadian prayer miscellany websites, but these aren't really about me. They're about the Acadian prayers. So where can they find me? Yeah. I mean, I, I've i got a book with uh, Penn State University Press that, uh, that introduces and surveys all of the Acadian literature for like 2,500 years. You can find me there in, in print. Great. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll make sure to link as much of that as we can find. And so all the different ways, if someone would like to find you, they can, we will make you findable. And I, I get a lot of email, you know, um, I don't love some of the emails I get, <laughs> but yeah, they can email me and I try to reply to everything, even if it's sorry, I can't help you with that. Great. I don't have a YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> Many of us don't. It's too hard to maintain. So we'll definitely link everything so people can find you if they would like to find you and they can choose the preferred medium. But thank you so much again for joining me. I mean, it's it's been such a pleasure to, to speak to you this morning. So I, I don't know how, but I hope we can have you back in some capacity at some point. I love your project. Good luck with, with this and keep up the good fight of making the ancient world accessible to the general public and interested peoples. And this was something new, like your email was one of the good emails that I got sort of out of the blue, a little bit more exciting than say the local guy who wants me to talk about prayers for Ishtar so we can go into the mountains and pray to her. Although that's interesting too, on a different level, but I think you guys are doing really interesting work here and I really appreciate, and I, I love the format, the sort of, Rewheeling. I think I'm good at that. I like to just shoot the breeze. I'm the only person who studies the ancient world at my university. I'm the only person. We're mostly focused on health sciences, which is really great. The, the health sciences here are super, super strong. We have a great dental school, great pharmacy. But in terms of the humanities, you know, I'm the only ancient historian. So don't get to talk shop a lot. So this has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Trireme Transit is now departing ancient office hours. Next stop is Present Ponderings.